Good morning and welcome to those of you joining us on Zoom. Uh, good morning and welcome to WIDA and our spotlight series of interviews with key figures in the global trade community. Before we get to today's event, a few notes on upcoming WIDA events. Next Thursday, November 16th, we're hosting the next in our series of spotlight events with Ambassador Carla Hills, who served as the United States Trade Representative to President George Herbert Walker Bush from 1989 to 1993, where she negotiated both the original North American Free Trade Agreement and the Uruguay Round of the GATT. The following day on November 17th, we'll look at the recent U.S. announcement to withdraw its support from certain digital trade proposals at the WTO. It's caused a lot of conversation here in Washington and around the world. We also hope you watch your inbox for announcements about other upcoming events, including a retrospective event in December looking back at 250 years since the Boston Tea Party made trade a flashpoint in American politics before there even was a United States. And of course, our 2024 Washington International Trade Conference on February 12th and 13th with both online and in-person components. Information on these events and how you can support WIDA's work can be found at www.wita.org. As you know, if you've watched any of our more than 250 webinars since 2020, we like to call up the names of some of those who are with us online, but you can't see on Zoom. So welcome today to Ann Collett, the Deputy Head of Trade Policy at the British Embassy, Leslie Griffin at Alinea LLC in Boston, Nelson Cunningham at Business Council for International Understanding, and Jaime Castaneda at National Milk Producers. Welcome, Anne, Leslie, Nelson, and Jaime, and welcome to all of you. If you're watching on Zoom, you can ask questions of Ambassador Froman using the Q&A tab on Zoom, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can towards the end of our discussion. Our speakers today need no introduction, so I won't say much here, but to tell all of you that today is the first in a series of spotlight events we'll be hosting at WIDA with my dear friend, Ambassador Rufus Yerksa. Rufus is a senior advisor at McClarty Associates, uh, former WTO Deputy Director General and a former Deputy United States Trade Representative. As we mentioned before, we'll continue the series next week with Ambassador Carla Hills and continue into the new year with other distinguished speakers. And we're so glad to click off this series with my old friend, Ambassador Mike Froman. I've known Mike since he was Chief of Staff at the U.S. Treasury in the mid-90s. And of course, then in his various roles in and out of government, including as former United States Trade Representative under his good friend, President Barack Obama. We hosted Mike's final speech on trade as USTR in January 2017. And we're delighted to welcome you back, Mike, in your new role as President of the Council on Foreign Relations. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Ken. Thanks so much. And uh, let me uh, thank you and WIDA for uh, hosting this important series of one-on-one -on -one, uh, armchair discussions with prominent figures. I'm so happy that we're starting with uh, Ambassador Froman. Um, Mike and I have known each other a long time, worked together uh, in the early years of the Clinton administration when he was a key player in the White House and I was at USTR. And of course, I followed uh, his career and worked with him in his iterations as uh, President Obama's chief uh, Sherpa and then USTR. Uh, and then, of course, as a business leader, as vice chairman of MasterCard. And Mike, it's great to see you back in Washington uh, as the President of Council of Foreign Relations. Let me just spend a couple of minutes, if you don't mind, Mike, kind of setting the table for this discussion. Uh, why did we want to look at the, the paradigm shift on U.S. trade policy and discuss that? And I must admit, that's sort of a, a term that I, I cooked up after looking kind of at a snapshot of where we were in 2016 and where we are today on trade. I mean, we spend a lot of time in Washington talking about you know, individual things that have happened, but this is kind of a broader perspective and that's why it's so good to get your wisdom and experience and knowledge about it. I mean, if you go back to 2016, of course, you know the whole litany of things that were underway then. Uh, we were working on trying to complete two of the largest free trade agreements um, in our history, certainly the two largest since the NAFTA. Uh, the TPP, which you negotiated, had already been signed, um, and the TTIP negotiations with the EU, the largest bilateral trade and investment relationship in the world. I think together those two agreements, if we put them in place, would have meant a sort of a free U.S. being in a free trade region with a, with a 
over two thirds of global GDP. So that's very interesting. Um, of course, it, in U.S.-China relations, we disputes had been accelerating, but the U.S. was really relying more on collective pressures from TPP and with other FDA partners uh, and aggressive use of WTO disputes and, and bilateral engagement. Those were the main instruments. Uh, uh, on the WTO, we were still engaging in a lot of reforms. We were active players in the WTO, but not happy with its progress and looking for modernization. And we were still an active user of the dispute settlement system. Uh, and there was also, of course, aggressive enforcement of a number of our trade laws, unfair trade laws, particularly in areas like anti-dumping, um, you know, everything from CFIUS to export controls, things that, you know, were, were going on in that era. But I would say overall, we were still working, operating within the basic framework of the kind of trade paradigm which had developed uh, after the Cold War in the 1990s. So what happened after the 2016 election? Well, we all know, I mean, the first official act of President Trump was to withdraw the U.S. from TPP. And, and somewhat surprisingly, the deal went forward with all the other partners, of course. TTIP gradually died uh, because of tensions between the two sides, but also uh, President Trump's took a more critical view of Europe in areas like autos and other things. And then there came, of course, a series of major actions, you know them, the steel and aluminum tariffs based on a much broader interpretation of our national security law that really for the first time established that protecting economic security could be part of protecting national security. And then the long trade fight with China, which led to uh, substantial tariff increases on a majority of, of uh, imports on in the Section 301 case um, on China's state-driven economy. That, uh, that fight eventually led to a deal, uh, one for China to increase imports of certain products, and maybe we can talk about how successful that's been. But most of those tariffs, of course, remained in place even after that deal. And the, the only meaningful FTA a negotiation through that era was, was an important one. It was the renegotiation of NAFTA, now USMCA, which did maintain the FTA features, but toughened some of the rules of origin, on, particularly on autos, and, and modernized the trade rules in areas such as digital trade and worker protections. Um, now, President Biden's trade policy has avoid, avoided getting back into big new FTAs, opting instead for these framework exercises on underlying commercial and regulatory issues with first with the Indo-Pacific countries and IPEF, a fairly broad and expansive set of talks, and then in the TTC framework with the EU, addressing areas such as the digital economy, supply chain resiliency, environment related issues, worker protections, and a number of other things. It's unclear where those exercises are going, but um, Many IPEF partners, for example, are complaining about the lack of any real market access component. And we can talk about that. And as we all know, Biden has, of course, kept in place many of the Trump, most of the Trump tariffs. Uh, tensions with China have increased for a number of reasons, including, of course, its support of Russia in, in Ukraine and growing Chinese threats to Taiwan and the South Sea region, which has made trade relations much more difficult. I, I know you probably work on those issues a lot in your new role as, as president of CFR. And, and Biden has ramped up actions on a number of national security, export control, and outbound investment issues with China. He's also kept in place many of the steel and aluminum tariffs, although negotiated some QR type arrangements to replace the tariffs uh, for certain countries. And finally, uh, the Biden administration, of course, has jointly developed with Congress a whole new program of industrial policy type measures, tax credits and direct subsidies aimed at promoting U.S. investment and in self-sufficiency in areas like EVs and green energy products. Uh, these have included as major component uh, extensive new domestic content made in America type restrictions uh, requiring U.S. manufacturing or assembly, or in some cases, inputs from other FTA partners. Um, and these have been a major change from prior U.S. law, and in the view of many, a change in a longstanding U.S. trade policy uh, plank, which is to challenge those types of measures around the world under the national treatment principle. So these are just some of the outlines of what I wanted to start talking with you about, which is, you know, how has the paradigm shifted? 
uh, and what are its consequences. So let me start by sort of a broad question, which is, uh, you know, do you see this as a true paradigm shift? And what do you think are its implications and significance, both both economically and for our our uh, trade relations around the world and our leadership role in the trading system? So first of all, thank you um, for having me and for doing this. And any time that Ken or Rufus calls, I'm going to say yes. So I'm delighted to be to be here at WITA again. Um, maybe for just to put it in in an even broader context, I think looking back, we think about the Cold War period as lasting about 40 years. A bipolar world, really in retrospect, fairly clear what the rules of the road were. Uh, who was with us, who was against us, what the tools of policy were. Cold War comes to an end. We have the post-Cold War period, which was more of an American unipolar moment. And it coincided with the expansion of globalization. And so that was a period of great trade liberalization, economic reform in countries uh, around the world, market liberalization generally in countries uh, around the world, great period for uh, poverty alleviation, uh, for the de development of international cooperation on all sorts of issues. That lasted 30 years and has come to an end. And we don't really know what this new period uh, is yet, what it's to be called, what's it all about, and what the rules are. So I, I guess my first reaction to your, your question and to your point was, uh, we, I think we may be in the midst of a paradigm shift. Uh, we're leaving one paradigm, but I'm not sure what the new paradigm is that we're going to, or whether some of the things we're seeing right now are sort of part of a transition to some uh, new paradigm. Because there's still a lot of unanswered questions about all of the issues that, uh, that, that you raised. Um, I think there has been a convergence of national security and economics when you and I first started working together in the early 90s, you know, you'll recall that was the era of the Clinton administration saying it's the economy, stupid. And it was lifting up economic, domestic economic issues uh, to be on parallel with foreign policy because there was a view that foreign policy had sort of overwhelmed economic, uh, economic issues. Um, you know, that, I think, has now kind of come full circle where national security policy, you've got you know, people at the Pentagon now opening up you know, manuals to learn about supply chains and you know, uh, new technologies in the domestic and civilian sphere that could have big implications for our military and intelligence capabilities. And so I, the, the two worlds are becoming converged. And again, I'm not sure exactly how they're going to sort how they're going to sort themselves um, how they sort themselves out. But I think the period of of hyper-globalization where the, the focus was on continued opening, reform, trade liberalization. Uh, um, I think that, at least for now, is over. And, um, and the question will be, how do we evolve our policies going forward, including the role of the US in demonstrating international economic leadership um, to get the benefits of that period while addressing what has emerged as the downsides, the concerns, and the political reaction that is legitimate and has to be addressed. So that's a very interesting perspective because essentially you're saying that this new paradigm is still unfolding and its future direction has to be determined. But I, I think you're saying that it's pretty clear that we're not going back to the old paradigm exactly as it was. I think that's right. I mean, it's, again, in, I think it's hard to imagine just saying, OK, we're going to we're going to turn the clocks back 20 years because a number of the assumptions that we had back then, I think, have proven um, uh, difficult to, to, to justify or to to confirm. Um, the world has changed a lot since then. And uh, I think, again, the politics, I, I, I view poly politics more as a, a an important uh, um, a data point, if people are feeling like the system isn't working for them, that the level, the playing field is not level, that they're not getting the benefits of these policies, then we're not going to have the support for them. And, the, and that, those feelings are are real. Uh, and even if our, our economists tell us 
well, you know, it's 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 good on the whole for society. We know that that we have done an inadequate job, Republican and Democratic administrations, of addressing the domestic policies that are necessary mm-hmm. for people to feel sufficiently confident, um, sufficiently integrated uh, into the economy to weather the ups and downs of of global economic trends. And so I think that's, I think whatever the new paradigm is, I think has to take that seriously, has to take that seriously into account. And that's what's driving in part these new industrial policy measures that are so focused on increasing U.S. investment and, and production in areas where not only we have a climate change agenda, but also very big concerns about China's leadership yeah. role or China's leadership position in in those in those uh, uh, industries. Let let me in fact turn to because you know you've really focused on sort of two drivers of this paradigm shift. One sort of the external driver of the changes geopolitically in the world and the other of course in dissatisfaction within our own economy and those play off of each other but you know just focusing on the external for the moment um you know, this is a pretty massive change since the era you and I worked on under Clinton when it looked like, um, you know, a kind of one, a more unified worldview with uh, countries even like China and Russia joining uh, a rules-based multilateral system seemed like a good bet. Uh, and a lot of people say now it's it's pretty obvious we're, we're seeing an increasingly, an increasing bipolarity um, China-led sort of uh, poll on one side of much more authoritarian uh, government-led systems versus um, some alliance U.S.-led of of democrat more democratically free market economies. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about how you see that trend moving and and the implications, and then maybe we can get a little bit to the the domestic, not only the politics. You and I don't talk about politics per se, but the impact of politics on where we're taking trade policy domestically. We can look at the 2024 election and its potential um, for those issues being involved. But maybe start with with the bipolarity. And, and if you want, talk about China as well. Now, I actually don't think, um, I don't think fundamentally we're in a bipolar system the way that we were during the Cold War, uh, in part because uh, I mean, China is obviously, you know, the the the, the most significant um, influence out there right now that we have to deal with. But it's it's not as though there are China is not the same kind of, of superpower, so to speak, in terms of alliances um, as well as economic ties that the Soviet Union tried to be during the Cold War. Obviously, it's a much more successful economy, but its relations with the rest of the world, in, in my view, it's not that there's bipolarity. I think, you know, as, as, as some have called it, uh, I think it's really something closer to what we might call um, being polyamorous, right? You've got countries like India who love us for our technology, love us for our nuclear cooperation, uh, increasingly uh, for our, our um, uh, uh, for our military cooperation, but they love Iran for oil. They love Russia uh, for oil and arms. They're in the bricks with China. Um, sometimes they love China. Sometimes they don't love China. So it's a just more complicated world. It's not black and white. It's not us and them. It's it's I think much more nuanced and complicated for 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 us to manage. I think going going forward. Um, you know, having said that, I think the overall trend that you're pointing to, which is you've got countries increasingly comfortable with abandoning economic liberalization, market liberalization, openness, and leaning more into state intervention in the economy, including here in the United States. Having spent years, decades, um, lecturing other countries, encouraging China to open up, uh, to discouraging them from industrial policy, uh, discouraging them from from putting restrictions on uh, investments and things of that sort, We've basically, instead of China becoming more like us, which is what we expected that to happen as they become integrated into the international system, we have become more like China. So we have 
you know, more protectionist policies. We have more tariffs up. We have uh, foreign investment screening uh, inward, certainly, and now potentially outward. Um, uh, and, and, and we've now engaged in full scale industrial policy in a limited set of sectors, uh, much like that, which we did, we uh, it discouraged other countries from pursuing. So let me let me pursue that a little bit more, Mike, because you know obviously you played uh, the leading role or a strong leading role in in getting TPP, and I, I I wonder if you have some thoughts about where we are with China now, um, in the wake of the the trade war and the relatively unsuccessful deal on on uh, market access to China, the trade balance with China hasn't changed very much. There have been some increases in exports, but also uh, even notwithstanding the tariffs, still a huge trade deficit. Maybe some shifts out of China, but um, to a large extent, it hasn't you know, resolved many of the grievances that the U.S. had about China's system. Where do you think things would have been? I, I know it's hard to look at the world hypothetically, but where do you think how do you think that might have been different if TPP had been successful and the U.S. had stayed in? Hmm. Well, let me take it in, in, in two pieces. Um, you know, one, you know, as I've said before, and I fully recognize that the politics are such that uh, the, I'm not holding my breath for the U.S. rejoining uh, uh, CPTPP. But uh, I have said uh, that I think the withdrawal from TPP was it will be seen by historians as one of the greatest strategic blunders in U.S. policy. Um, and I believe that because I think, and we're seeing it right now, I think the countries in the region, the more China um, asserts itself and reestablishes itself, you know, it's for the last 15 centuries, it was the dominant power in that, that region and, and the dominant economy in the world for 13 of the last 15 centuries. Um, it, it's reestablishing itself as the dominant power uh, in, in that region and beyond. And the more they do so, the more those countries want us in the picture. They want to have relations with us. They want to, us to balance China's influence. Um, they don't want to be forced to choose between us and China, but they want there to be more than China in their lives. And TPP would have provided that in a very powerful way. I think this administration is um, making an effort to use IPEF uh, as an alternative to that and still get the countries in the region around a table to to do what can be done in our current context. But EP, TPP, in my view, would have um, um, would have solidified that in a, to a much greater extent. So that's one piece of it. I think the second piece, though, on on uh, China itself is, um, you know, we have made clear that we're not trying to keep China down. We're not trying to prevent their growth. Indeed, given the fact that China has been responsible for about a third of all global growth over the last decade, um, it's in all of our interests, including U.S. economic interests, that China and the rest of the world uh, continues to grow. But having had the experience that we have had with China in terms of um, forced technology transfer, uh, IP, a variety of other uh, uh, policies that they've engaged in, I think uh, this administration has said and has taken those actions to ensure that we are domest investing domestically as we need to, to maintain leadership in absolutely critical technologies uh, for, for the future. And uh, I think that will be the defining feature going, going forward. You know, I think the challenge is that the, whether it's the IRA uh, or the or the Chips Act, these were in some ways aberrations of U.S. historic of U.S. policy historically. It's been difficult to get broad bipartisan support by Congress to fund in a very significant way industrial policy. Uh, we haven't had a lot of experience with that. So this goes way back to your first question, Rufus. Is this a paradigm shift or is this a temporary blip? Um, is this something we're going to do going forward on one sector after another that we deem to be strategic? Or um, is this is this really an isolated incident? Because China and other countries will continue to invest as they do in, in yeah. sectors that they deem to be important. Yeah, you know, as you know, I mean, there, there were certainly a lot of brave talk about we, we really need to decouple from China's economy. I mean, the Biden administration has kind of changed that uh, that theme and, and talks more about de-risking our economy. And that 
and recognizing that there's always going to have to be both economic engagement and engagement in areas like climate change and others. But um, I guess the bigger question I have about about China is how much has the new geopolitical tensions impacted this effort to have some kind of a modus vivendi on economic issues? I mean, it's support of, of Russia uh, and it's more bellicose uh, uh, both rhetoric and some military actions in, in the South China Sea. Well, look, I, I think the, the shift in, in the in the trade paradigm was already well underway, you know, and I think, actually, I think the big moment in some ways it goes back to, uh, call it 2015, when uh, President Xi Jinping came out and rather than, you know, a hide and bide, which had been the China Chinese strategy since Deng, basically came out and said, we do want to be dominant in the following critical sectors. We are going to, I mean, they, in, in many respects, China was the first decoupler because they were, China was the one who said, we are going to be dominant. We're going to be self-reliant. Um, we're going to have the, uh, I can't remember that they call it the two economies or they, they were, they were going to invest domestically to ensure that they could remain dominant in, in, uh, or become dominant in these absolutely critical sectors for their competitiveness and, of course, has military or intelligence capabilities as well, some of them, um, go, going forward. And so that was a key moment. And I think you saw the shift in uh, perspective here domestically on both the Democratic and the Republican side of the aisle. Here we have a broad bipartisan consensus. How this is playing out in terms of their support for Russia and Ukraine uh, or the expansion of the BRICS or their involvement in the Middle East, I think this is all part of, of China uh, trying to step into a global role um, uh, and they're experimenting. You know, they experimented for a while with wolf warrior diplomacy. I don't think that bought them many friends. I don't think that, I don't think that was terribly successful. They've experimented with the Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah. Uh, uh, poured a lot of money into a lot of countries. I don't think it translated terribly well into soft power. I think now they're experimenting with playing a more active role diplomatically. And uh, again, whether it's Ukraine or uh, the Middle East, if the, the Saudi-Iran deal that, that, that they were present for or, uh, the, uh, or, or offering to be helpful between uh, Israel and the Palestinians, I think um, uh, they're trying now to play that kind of global role. We'll see whether they're able to contribute something constructively or not. Yeah, well, that's a good discussion on China. We leave it there. I mean, obviously, I, I'm very concerned about Xi Jinping in particular and his orientation driving towards a much more state driven state ownership style of economy and uh, that, that prospects of any kind of, you know, more market oriented reforms that could could help resolve some of these things. But uh, we could go on and talk about China forever. Let's let's shift. I'd like to shift to the domestic kind of politics and and uh, its impact on trade uh, and then maybe end with uh, some discussion on multilateral issues. Um, you know, we may see a rerun of a, in fact, very likely to see a rerun now of a Trump-Biden uh, presidential election. Uh, Biden, for his own part, doesn't talk much about trade per se. He's kept in place, as I said, a lot of Trump's measures. He's focusing, though, on keeping a democratic alliance together to deal with these uh, big geopolitical challenges and also uh, to work on areas like climate change and other things and on China. So he's working with wants to stay working with Europeans and Japan and others um, and spends a lot of time on that. Trump, for his part, um, has. Uh, once again, gotten very strong into the tariff idea. He's proposed this new 10% across the board tariff with the sort of banal sounding description of ring around the collar, um, which sort of trivializes it. But, you know, it is uh, he's the first president, uh, first candidate for president since really since Warren Harding to propose a broad across the board tariff increase. Uh, this would be a tripling of, more than a tripling of average US tariffs, almost a five-fold increase. Um, 
not sure what his prospects would even be if he got elected, but the point is he's campaigning on it. So I wanted you to talk a bit about, uh, you know, the different, do you, where you see the fault lines in, in that election and uh, how big and significant they would be for determining what the future of this new paradigm might be. So I, I don't think there'll be too many fault lines on China. Uh, I think there's a pretty broad consensus, at least as to the nature of the challenge um, and some of the immediate measures. Um, whether there's disagreement about where the ultimate relationship ultimately goes and what the new equilibrium is, we haven't really had that conversation uh, in, in, in the political system in the U.S. And there's a lot of work, I think, to be done in that regard. Um, I don't think there'll be big political divisions over trade liberalization. I think big trade agreements, traditional FTAs, certainly multilateral agreements are off the table for now. And so there may be marginal ones. Um, you can see the occasional bilat, uh, maybe something with the UK, maybe something with Kenya, but I wouldn't expect there to be a robust uh, trade agenda of, of trade liberalization being proposed by, by either candidate um, uh, going into the going into the election. Um, you know, I, I think the tariff issue, and, and, and this is a problem more generally, I think in public policy, I think we need to ensure that we're understanding uh, what the trade-offs are of any policy proposal that that's out there. Um, we dislike being overly dependent on China for our manufacturing. We also dislike inflation. And the actions we're taking, for one, will raise the cost of living for consumers and for companies that rely on imports as part of their manufacturing process. That's a perfectly acceptable trade-off to make. We, we can, and, and that's what the political process is for, is to have elections and have politicians run on various issues and make decisions that they're willing to have Americans pay more to spend more of their disposable income on you know, basic goods in order to avoid overdependence on China. But we should make that trade-off explicit and make sure that we're understanding what the costs and benefits are of going down uh, the different road. The 10% tariff, I think the, the, the burden, I think, is on the, 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 uh, the proponents of that proposal to lay out what would be the benefits of that. Do we expect it to bring in bring back manufacturing to the U.S. in all sorts of sectors where we currently don't manufacture? And has there been a record of that? For example, have the China tariffs led to the reshoring of major industries? I haven't seen data to that extent, but that would be an interesting thing uh, to look at. If you have a 10% tariff, what will that do to the cost of living for the average American? We know the, the US tariffs are inherently regressive, right? Because uh, folks at the uh, lower income levels tend to spend a higher proportion of their disposable income on imported goods, whether it's clothing, shoes, food, et cetera. And so as well, those well, I was I was going to say, Mike, that, you know, historically, the highest tariffs in the U.S. tariff schedule on manufactured were in areas like footwear and, and apparel and notwithstanding those tariffs, those industries declined uh, substantially. So, so I think it's exactly. So that's why I think it's important to have analytical, good, rigorous analytical work. You know, people like Chad Bone at, uh, at Peterson who um, you know, have done really good work on, okay, what's been the impact of the tariffs? What's been the impact of these agreements? Uh, have they achieved what they set out to achieve? And if it's about gaining leverage, because I've heard some arguments, well, we, the, we haven't taken down the tariffs with China or even um, with, with our European friends because it's a source of leverage. As a former trade negotiator, you know, you and I, we, we love leverage. I mean, it would be great to have leverage, but you, leverage is only useful if you take it out for a drive. And so you got to know what you want for that. And I'm not aware that we have a, a yeah. we've really laid out an agenda to say we would reduce tariffs on non-strategic items with China if they did the following. And, if and they arguably, don't, more, arguably more targeted leverage, because if you do an across the board thing like this, don't you think the the widespread reaction around the world would be to impose reciprocal kinds of tariffs? Oh, absolutely. The, the we've already shown, 
And that happened, obviously, in the, with the Trump tariffs uh, as well that the, that the Chinese yeah. put on retaliatory tariffs yeah. to the degree that they that they could, given the and the Europeans and, trip, the Europeans and the Europeans did as well and others. Yeah, exactly. So I all I I think on all these issues, I think the the the, the main point is we really need to understand one: what are they for? What, how do you define success? What's been the history of what impact they've had? And what are the costs and benefits? And, and what are the trade-offs involved in going down that road? And make sure that everyone's comfortable with their trade-offs. We spent, you know, the, the period, that, that period of post-Cold War period and, and even longer, the, the globalization period was really about efficiency and getting goods into the hands of consumers at the lowest price possible. Okay. Uh, and that, that came at a, at a trade-off with resilience, redundancy, um, et cetera, um, and diversification, and which are which is now being rectified. But we, but it means that it will be by definition less efficient. And we'll but wasn't end it up also higher was, cost? Yeah, absolutely, no question about that. But wasn't it also about expansion of our our markets? I mean, with ninety eight percent of the world's consumers absolutely. abroad and our most innovative industries, how do they grow? Domestically, if they don't have the the, the markets around the world, uh, you know, look, absolutely. Look, I, I you know, th- um, when the Biden administration came in um, and, and and promoted a worker centric trade policy, I, I'm 100 percent supportive. I also thought what we were doing by opening other markets disproportionately to our market because we're mm-hmm. already open uh, by giving a uh, powerful incentive to to um, locate supply chains in a way that includes the U.S. market by integrating us again through some of these agreements. But that was also pro-worker because we know that particularly our workers who work in the export sector tend to get paid more than workers who don't. And if we can expand exports, it's going to help grow our manufacturing base, help grow our, our services base. And that's going to be a positive for the, the the workers that they employ, as well as, of course, agriculture. So um, uh, I think we've now taken a different approach and you know the question is whether tariffs and subsidies um, uh, will achieve that result, and and also the balance between subsidies and tariffs. If we take what we've just done with IRA and the Chips Act, I think we're going to see a lot of investment in the U.S. It's going to crowd in a ton of investments already happening. We're going to see a lot of jobs in those in those particular sectors. Does that then obviate the need for also imposing tariffs? on others or or not and how does one make the trade-offs between those so before we turn to the multilateral i just wanted to ask you you know in terms of figuring out how to get that balance right and creating a, a more consistent coherent uh set of principles for whatever the new trade policy paradigm is going to be in the United States. I mean, you spent a lot of time obviously doing this at USTR. I remember many exercises we had in the, both the Bush and Clinton administrations about what, what should our trade policy uh, anchors be. And I'm just wondering if you think um, in a second, let's say Biden wins instead of Trump in a second Biden administration, do you think there will be an effort to expand that sort of search for a new trade paradigm beyond the what they, the current parameters are. They, they talk about worker-centric trade policy, but putting meat on those bones and on other aspects of what we want to achieve. Well, I think we, I think, I think we would be well-placed to put meat on those bones and to really flesh it out as to what that means. Um, and, you know, again, now having experimented with tariffs, with uh, subsidies, industrial policy, uh, these sorts of framework agreements, how do they work? And what have we learned from them? Um, and, and what do we want to take forward? Which ones do we want to emphasize going forward? So, you know, I view the, the, the this this first uh, these first few years of the of the Biden administration has been a very fertile time to try a number of different things. I think a future administration um, should look and look empirically as well on what's been the impact and has it achieved their the stated objectives and which ones do we really want to take forward? And that will help. I think that will help inform the trade paradigm. Now we're only, we're obviously the, the most important economy in the world, the largest economy in the world, but we're only one economy in the world. And I think that's a starting point because then we need to go out and engage with our allies and partners um, to help build support for what that new paradigm should look like internationally. And you know, again, I take China as the example. Our perspectives on China are closer now with the European Union than they've ever been. 
Yeah. They weren't always this way. It wasn't that long ago, five, six years ago, when we had really quite disparate views of the China challenge. But I think Europe's come a long way uh, in, in our direction. Having said that, I think the Europeans are, are suspicious that that we are viewing everything through a China lens, almost in a Cold War perspective, kind of a black and white with us against us mentality. Mm -hmm. They're not fully convinced by that. And I think they're waiting for us to lay out a coherent view of where we want to take that relationship, what the new equilibrium is. You know, is it a Cold War? Is it detente? Is it peaceful coexistence? Is it something that, you know, didn't exist in the US-Soviet context because of the different nature of the relationship? Something that they can provide some input into and that they can buy into. And that will create a much firmer foundation going forward than uh, than what we have right now, which I think is still sort of just the beginnings of convergence on what the nature of the challenge is. Well, that's a great segue to some of the multilateral challenges because I want to bring the, you know, the WTO into this discussion, my old stomping grounds. You and I both worked a lot on that in the in the Clinton administration. Uh, and you know, it's very unclear where it goes now. I mean, it, the debate always drives me a little bit crazy because you hear people talking about how the WTO has lost its, its sense of direction. But of course, as you, as you know, the WTO can only uh, have a direction that is driven by its powerful members. And uh, that's the real you know that's the nub of the of the issue is how you work together in an institution that you know operates on consensus and that has china and russia in it and the us let alone our differences maybe with the europeans over certain aspects of it but i'm wondering about for example the 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 obvious differences that emerged over <clears throat> the dispute settlement system that led the trump administration to block Pellet body membership. And so now we don't have a functioning dispute settlement system in the same way. Um, and whether or not we can also cope with the, the broad divisions between major economies like the US and China uh, in kind of helping to craft a, a path forward in, in the WTO system, obviously not before the 2024 election, I'm thinking in the longer term, but what do you think? So the concerns about the dispute settlement body, you know, predated, predated Trump, to be fair. It was during the Obama administration, I think perhaps even, perhaps even earlier, um, in terms of views that the appellate body had gone beyond uh, its a mandate uh, to, to to begin to make trade law rather than just interpret it. Um, so, you know, when I was there, we also prevented the appointment of an appellate body member, but we allowed for the appointment of an alternative member. Well, that's who, a big difference. That's a big difference. So that's a big difference. But I just want to, you know, to, for the record, the the complaints about the dispute settlement body did not begin did not begin with uh, the Trump administration. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I and I still feel like that of all the WTO issues. That is the one in, that should be easiest to fix uh, with collective leadership from some of the major economies. Going back to the Uruguay Round Agreement, grounding the now that we've seen some experience with the dispute settlement procedure, um, you know, making sure that we can reach a consensus around how it should go forward. And so I, 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 I feel like that one should be solvable over time. And I think that would be important um, for not only for for the use by, on WTO mechanisms, a like Uruguay round commitments and things of that sort. But uh, increasingly, as there are bilateral, regional and plurilateral sectoral agreements, uh, it, it would be useful to have an international dispute body that had the credibility and integrity and, and widely viewed as such to be able to be a utility to solve, resolve some of those disputes. I think the negotiation function of the WTO in terms of broad big multilateral rounds, it's hard for me to see that happening in the future, at least in the near future. I think yeah. we're much likely to be, there's any negotiation going on, I think we're much likely to see sectoral, bilateral, plurilateral agreements, ideally consistent with broader WTO principles. <coughs> but I would put the focus there rather than not trying to restart multilateralism itself. And that trend was well underway even before the block. Absolutely. 
Uh, we were doing, you know, we were doing, we were doing. Things. Uh, RCEP was out there. Uh, there were lots of FTAs being negotiated. And, you know, there was agreements like the, the ITA and uh, work at, on environmental agreements and TISA and things of that sort. So there's a long, I think, history there. My guess is that's really what the future looks like there as well. Um, and then I think the, the WTO, its third function, which is really monitoring the trade policies of countries and reviewing them, I think that could still play an active role. We just need to encourage everyone to participate. We often, as I recall, the U.S. often ends up reporting on other countries' trade practices more than those countries themselves because the other countries are not being terribly transparent and visible about it. And so um, I think if, if, if countries, if, you know, I, I see this when I travel around the world, if emerging economies, developing countries, European economies really want to see the WTO have a meaningful function going forward, then everyone's got to really participate in making that piece of it as robust as possible. Mike, I have to ask you about one particular area because you were so involved uh, when you were uh, negotiating TPP, and that is, you know, the U.S. has indicated that it's withdrawing its support for certain proposals on digital trade issues, WTO, and in the context of IPEF and other things. And I'm wondering if you have some some concerns about that, some thoughts about it. Um, what do you think would would be the impact and the implications for for the U.S. and and for our for our leadership role on those issues? Well, I heard Ken say you guys are having a big uh, session on this in a couple of weeks' time, and I, I think that's uh, that's probably very uh, very timely because I think we're all absorbing you know the recent announcements and look are looking forward to learning more details uh, about it. You know, clearly, uh, you know, services are now eighty percent of our economy here in the U.S. Digital elements of the services are an increasingly important part, not just to big tech companies, but to every company. And including every manufacturing company is increasingly a data company. Uh, data is a, a key part of what they do. Um, uh, I, I recall from the TPP negotiations when we were talking about data flows that you know, when an airplane is flying around the world, its jet engine is sending data constantly to um uh, uh, two centers all over the world that allow people to monitor when it needs maintenance, when it's in disrepair, when it's in danger. I don't think that's something we want to, to discourage or allow countries to take action to discourage um, because it has such a big implication for the manufacturing of those planes and and engines and the safety of the, of the passengers. And so um, I think I, I understand uh, countries wanting to have policy space, so to speak, uh, particularly in a fast changing uh, economic sector. Um, but I also believe there are some fundamental principles that one could lay out and we have laid out over the years but, that, but these, that are important. But this withdrawal of, of support for certain things seems to be driven by political pressure in the U.S. to preserve policy space at home on these issues. Well, that's right. Look, we're, I think the, the, uh, here in the U.S., uh, there, we have so much conversation going on about what is the appropriate way of regulating some of the activities of our big technology companies around competition policy uh, and, and issues of that sort. Uh, I, I think the key thing, and, and, I, and that's an understandable and a very important, I think, uh, part of the agenda uh, at home. I think the key thing is to 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 be to figure out: Are there some core principles that we believe, we're, we're, regardless of where competition policy might take um, our interaction with the big tech companies, that we think are important to preserve to ensure that this increasingly critical part of our economy to increasingly important to our workers that we are ensuring that they can continue to grow the businesses that they work in and continue to develop the innovation we are the innovation center of the digital economy globally we don't want to we don't want to lose that that requires us to be able to have access to other markets to be able to uh, be able to to share data uh, from one location to another um, and so I, I would be hopeful that there could be a dialogue around 
what are the principles we can agree to now, even while some of the regulatory and competition elements of the landscape are still evolving. Great. I, I see Ken has jumped in, and that's usually a sign that we want to get to the questions from the audience. So, Ken, I'll leave it to you to to pitch those to, to thank, Mike. Thank, thanks, Rufus. This has been a great discussion so far. And and that last question Rufus asked, of course, uh, knocked out three of the questions, or maybe even four of the ones that were in the queue on the digital trade. But there was an aspect to it, um, a subtlety, maybe a little bit, um, Mike, that um, just follows on that, and then we can get into a couple other topics that have been raised. And that is, what do you see as the responsibility of the administration and specifically the United States Trade Representative to promote the interests of American firms operating globally? Do, is, is that a, should that be a priority for the United States government to support our businesses and their ability to function globally, export products and support uh, American workers through uh, their their global uh, footprint. Is that, should it be a priority anymore? And if it should be, how should that be achieved? That's a bigger question. Well, look, I, I, think, I think it should be a priority um, for the government to promote U.S. economic interests writ large. Um, and, you know, that includes the interests of, of, of uh, companies. It includes the interests of workers, of ranchers, of farmers. Uh, it's the economy as a whole. And by the way, it includes uh, the interests of our national security, you know, concerns um, to ensure because we're not just a mercantilist country. We're also the world's leading uh, military uh, superpower. And so we need to take those issues into account. And that's these issues need to, to, to find balance. Um, it's not one or another. They all go to the ensuring that we've got a strong economy, inclusive economy back here at home that benefits everybody. And that is, to me, the proper function uh, of, of government. Um, and so, you know, I, again, there's the lots of difficult trade offs there. And I don't think we should say it's, it's the role of government just to promote U.S. companies, regardless of whether it's having a positive effect on American workers, um, farmers, ranchers, and our national security. I think we have to make sure we're addressing all those issues. You know, that there, there's, and there's actually three questions that have come up in the chat as well about this balance between the costs and benefits of the various proposals. And, and you know, I think that's one of the, the big takeaways that I'm going to have from this is how we think about that balance. You know, you, you raised an interesting question about the impact of tariff tariffs on costs and inflation for American workers. You know, what is also the, the question about the retaliation that it does uh, when the other countries engage in their own tariff policies in response to the US tariff policies and, and where that may be headed. And I think one of the questions is how do we have that conversation here about the, the costs and the benefits and how, we, how could we move that conversation forward because it seems to be sort of a one side. We, we seem to talk only in the silos and not really about the all the different trade offs that you have to make across the board. Obviously, in your new role at CFR, you you have to deal with a lot more of those things, I, I think, than maybe in the narrow silo that we face in the trade world. Well, look, I think it, it, first of all, I think it starts with with data. I think it starts with information and, and doing the hard work of really thinking through, you know, not from an ideological perspective, are you free trade, are you against free trade, but what are the costs and benefits of particular policy actions? And I think we should force ourselves and force those we deal with um, to be held accountable for articulating those. And to say, if, look, if you wanted to adopt that proposal, fantastic. Um, you just gotta lay out what the costs and benefits are for doing that and how you're gonna measure whether that proposal has been successful and then be accountable for the results because we see it right now, just to go back to politics, which, you know, again, is not, not, is not my strong suit. Um, but, you know, you know, again, clearly free trade is not politically attractive right now, um, nor is inflation at a higher cost of living. Right. That's and so, for a lot of you know, voters. But I, I haven't heard a lot of uh, politicians from either party go out and say, look, here's the choice we face. Um, and here's, you know, and, and then to, to act accordingly. I think that's, 
again, it's easy for me to say it uh, at, at the Council on Foreign Relations because we're going to do that. We do do that. Like we, we can put those thoughts out there. We can work with our colleagues at other think tanks and research institutions to ensure that those that, that information, that data, those facts are out there. And then it's a question of, of really making sure they are part of the policymaking process. Yeah, you know, we only have a couple of minutes left. And, and um, so I wanna try again, try to pull together a, a couple of the themes. Um, I'm just gonna mention a couple of them. They're not exactly all the same, but just get your thoughts on these. Um, your, I wanna shout out your former MasterCard card colleague, Avery Jaffrey, who dropped a question in the, the Q and A. Um, wondering about what you think can be achieved at APEC. Um, the U.S. is hosting next week. Uh, you obviously um, took part in many different APEC forums and various different roles that you've served uh, in government over the years, and, and I think suspect in the private sector as well. Um, and and a I wouldn't call it a related question, a separate question. It's sort of a big picture one. I want you to close on after you maybe comment on the APEC. Uh, you know, what that, what the usefulness of that and, and what we might be able to achieve. Do you think, is the center of gravity changing within the administration um, on trade? Is, is you look at the AI uh, uh, rule that came out or uh, proposals that came out uh, last week or the week before, um, a lot of that moved to commerce. Um, a lot of that, the, the commerce department is doing a lot with that. It, it, they have a lot of the, the number of the things that they're going to be the ones focused leading on. And, you know, there's been a, sort of an active di discussion in the trade world. I think uh, Ted Alden uh, wrote uh, uh, an article about that, uh, that the center of gravity was moving from USTR to commerce. You know, do you see that happening? Do you think that's what, what do you think as a former USTR, but also former Treasury official, which Treasury is obviously hugely involved in trade now with you know, these export controls and investment control issues? You know, is the center of gravity moving away from USTR? Is that changed? Um, how do you see the future of USTR? So the APEC question and the USTR question, maybe to wrap things up. Great. Well, first on, on APEC, I mean, APEC, as you recall, was never really intended to be a place where um, concrete, enforceable commitments are made. It's much more of a forum for and fleshing out ideas, fleshing out areas of cooperation that sometimes then make their way into negotiations, like the the environmental goods discussion making its way into 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 that uh, conversation. Um, and I think this year's APEC looks to be on track to do that again in a number of areas, um, uh, whether it's anti-corruption, inclusiveness, sustainability. I think there'll be some good workmanlike outcomes there. I think the the, perhaps the most important part of what happens in San Francisco, though, might be not in the APEC leaders meeting per se, but the bilateral summit between President Biden and President Xi on one hand, and the meeting of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework countries on the other. And we've already talked about China, so I, I won't go there. But I think in terms of, of, uh, of IPEF, I think uh, the fact that it appears there'll be a, a supply chain agreement uh, that is fully legally scrubbed and ready to go is a is a good sign um, uh, that some other um, ag agreements that will lead in that direction on taxation and anti-corruption and, and uh, things of that sort are making good progress. Um, obviously, the trade pillar is the was always was always going to be the hardest pillar. Um, and I think there's still going to be a sorting out, particularly in light of the recent announcement on digital trade, what exactly is the agenda of that pillar and how it gets done. Uh, but I think given the fact uh, uh, that, that, that the IPEF has been around for about 18 months or so, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, uh, this is, 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 is fairly decent progress. And I think uh, that'll be a good outcome there uh, as well. And I think just stepping back more generally, that the fact that President Biden uh, and the U.S. administration will be demonstrating U.S. commitment to that region, this vitally important region, U.S. commitment to being a leader in that region, including on economics, in addition to obviously the military alliances and the like, I think that's a very important message and signal to send at this time while we have wars going on in, in Europe and the Middle East um, and, uh, and a number of other, you know, uh, uh, things that attract our attention uh, elsewhere. And so it's important as part of the overall relationship with the Asia Pacific region that the, pre that the U.S. is hosting this and that President Biden will be there to lead it. Uh, USTR and, and, and all of that. Look, I, I, I think uh, uh, 
uh, first of all, you know, as you know, trade has always been a multi agency effort to, to one degree or another. Um, I think USTR, you know, I'm, I'm obviously a huge fan of the institution, continues to have the real expertise when it comes to <coughs> negotiation of, of uh, trade related um, uh, agreements and the enforcement of our trade rights. Um, and I think that's absolutely critical and, and perhaps even you know, more critical going forward. And I think Secretary Armando at, at Commerce has done uh, an excellent job of, of uh, building that institution into, into new areas, including implementation of the CHIPS Act, uh, <coughs> the work on broadband, um, the, the revision of our approach to export controls, um, et cetera. You know, I, I've had the privilege of working at USCR the White House and Treasury, and so I'm, of course, fond of, of all three uh, institutions and working with commerce um, in, in all those capacities. And so I think they have a lot to contribute to each of them. Well, Mike, uh, thank you very much. I, I, we've already run over a little bit, and um, we still have a half dozen questions we didn't get to. Um, I'm going to email folks who are watching. Um, I'm going to send Mike all the questions that were asked um, so he sees what was asked and... and uh, We'll know about some of the other topics that were raised, but I think we covered most of it. Um, you know, there were some other uh, questions that came in about uh, uh, sort of, you know, the EU is acting in where places where we're not. Um, that it comes back to some of the digital issues, but on some other ones as well. Is one of the topics I know that people wanted to, to, were wondering about. You know, if in the absence of the U.S. legislative process, other countries are stepping up and doing things, and and that have an impact on American firms and workers. In different ways uh, that we didn't get to, so sorry about that. But we, we did try to get to as much as we could in this in this short hour. Uh, Mike, uh, thank you so much. Really great to see you. Um, uh, great to have you back on the WIDA platform, Rufus, my friend. Uh, so thank you so much for coming to us with this idea and bringing it to WIDA. Um, we're going to be continuing this discussion in the weeks to come and with uh, thank other you. trade leaders. Thank you, Ken. I just want to give a great shout out to Mike for getting us off to such a great start. I'm looking forward to the rest of the session and want to thank you and Wida and, of course, my colleagues at uh, McClarty Associates for giving me the time to do these events and uh, look forward to doing the, the next ones. Thanks very much, guys. Be well, and we'll see thank you. Soon. Thank you. Take care.